I have as an opening of this lesson uh, some humorous things I want to share with you. And you just kind of sit back and listen and get ready. In a few moments, we're going to take some notes. But, but let me just share this. Let me start off on this subject of discouragement by saying to you, you know it's going to be a bad day when <laughs> you turn on the morning news and they're displaying emergency routes out of your city. <laughs> or the sun comes up in the west. Or, or when your boss tells you not to bother taking off your coat. <laughs> when you jump out of bed in the morning and you miss the floor. <laughs> you know it's going to be a bad day. You know it's a bad day when the bird singing outside your bedroom window is a buzzard. <laughs> or when you wake up in the morning and your dentures are locked together. Here's, here's what I love. You know it's going to be a bad day when your horn accidentally gets stuck and you're following a group of hell's angels on the freeway. <laughs> yes. You know it's a bad day when you put both contact lens in the same eye. You know it's a bad day when you walk to work on a summer morning and find the bottom of your dress is stuck to the back of your pantyhose. You know, <laughs> bad day. <laughs> when you call your answering service and they tell you it's none of your business, it's going to be a bad day. <laughs> when you step on the scale and it reads tilt. <laughs> or when you call suicide prevention and they put you on hold, you know it's going to be a very bad day. Well, we all have bad days. In fact, what's interesting is when I did this lesson on discouragement, I was discouraged. And I think I probably did a better lesson because as I did it, it was one of those kind of days when I wasn't doing a good job as a parent. I was behind on two projects I needed to get done. There were a couple people in the office that enjoy the work responding in the way that I wanted to respond. And I thought, you know, God has a great sense of humor, doesn't he, huh? Yes. I'm going to do a lesson on dealing with discouragement, and, and, and I'm kind of down. So let me tell you what I know about discouragement, okay? Number one, everyone gets discouraged. That's the first thing I know about it. That's why this, in fact, let me just ask, make, I want to make sure that I'm talking, in fact, let me just ask, make, I want to make sure that I'm talking to the right crowd. Let me take a little poll here this afternoon. How many of you have been discouraged at least once? Would you raise your hand? Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yes. Are we talking about this morning or this afternoon, huh? I mean, wh which time of the day are we talking about? Well, th the reason we all laugh is we all understand. Everybody in this room, every person that receives this tape, they all understand discouragement. We all do. Leaders understand discouragement. Followers, we all understand. Okay, we all are discouraged. The second thing I know about discouragement, though, is that discouragement is contagious. And that's a real fact. I just asked you a moment ago, how many of you have been discouraged? Let me ask you another question. How many of you have been discouraged by a discouraging person? Yes. Oh, absolutely. They come into our life, don't they, huh? And, and they just, you know, they kind of, they just pull our energy out of us. I heard a great story the other day about a, a man who was getting ready to jump off a bridge to commit suicide, and a policeman got to him, crawled out of there on the edge, rest, risking his own life, so, kind of sat down beside him to be a, a friend. And the guy said, I'm just so discouraged, I'm going to jump off. And the, the policeman said, oh, no, no, it can't be that bad. Tell me the story, tell me the story. And so the guy told him the story. When he got done telling the story, they both jumped off. <laughs> huh? Well, well <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we all know what it's like to be discouraged by a you know, discouraging, discouraging friend. I have in your notes that working with people is a double-edged sword. One side encouragement and the other side discouragement. I, I remember one time hearing the president of a company saying to his company, our greatest asset is our people. And then the same breath he kind of sighed and he said, our greatest liability is our people. What I learned a long time ago is, is when you deal with people as you deal with people, and as I deal with people all our life, when you're in the people business, there are some incredible high moments, are there not? You watch them grow, you watch them develop, you, you watch them just uh, uh, blossom, and you have those high moments that probably are as high as you can get. Then when you deal with people, you have those incredibly low moments of where you say, man, we're not making progress, and people are falling through the cracks, and this is not the way it's supposed to be. I'm not getting to my dream as quick as I want to get to my dream. This whole process, okay? The third thing I want to say is that there are successful ways to deal with discouragement. 
We're all discouraged, but because of my people time, the last 25, 26 years, dealing with thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, spending thousands of hours in counseling, just dealing with people, what I have done is I have seen many people who were discouraged make a marvelous comeback. I've seen them get back up. And I have kind of logged, I have noted along the way, things that people do to get back up. And so we're going to do that. In a moment, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you about how to effectively deal with discouragement. Let me give you a case study that I think is, is, is tremendously helpful. The case study I want to do in the setting of this lesson today is about Elijah. And Elijah, of course, you know my background. I, I, I've been a pastor in my, in my past life. Elijah was a prophet. He was a prophet of Israel. And uh, he had a very discouraging thing happen to him in his career. Now, let me give you just, just a moment of background. Um, he lived during the time of King Ahab, and there was an issue of, of false gods and false prophets. And, and so the prophet Elijah came and kind of confronted Ahab. They met on this place called Mount Carmel. I've been there many, many times. I've taught lessons from Mount Carmel. And, and they, they, they did this thing where they brought everybody together of Israel, and, and they built an altar, and they prayed. And, and it was a great day for Elijah because God won. Okay, so it was a great day for him. And th that's kind of the setting. It is out of that great day, this leader of Israel, this prophet had, he went right out of probably the greatest time in his life to the greatest depression and discouragement of his life. And as I was looking at this the other day, I thought, this is so good, I want to put it in the lesson. So if you'll allow me here, let me give you here things that happen when people get discouraged. And these 10 things I'm going to give you are literally out of the life of Elijah. In other words, these are things that Elijah did in his life that caused him to become depressed and discouraged. Number one, exhaustion. When we're tired physically, emotionally, we set ourselves up for discouragement. Isn't that true? Now, I know that for a fact because I can tell you, when I'm coming in off a long trip and I'm flying back in and I've spent like I have for the last four or five days, when I'm just physically tired, I don't have much reserve left in my tank. And if anything happens that is of a negative a nature that begins to pull out that little bit of reserve, I go empty real quick. Do you relate to this? Yes. Um, I brought with me, a, as you know, I love to bring stuff and I got me a laminated thing here that makes it even more godly than it really is, okay? Um, and it's entitled, No Wonder Nothing Gets Done Around Here. This is about tiredness and exhaustion. Here are some absolutely irrefutable statistics that show exactly why you are tired. There aren't nearly as many people actually working as you may have thought, at least not according to this survey, and I have it in my hand. The population of this country is a little over 250 million. 84 million are over 64 years of age and retired. That leaves 166 million of us to do all the work. People under 20 years of age total 95 million. So that leaves 71 million to do the work. There are 27 million who are employed by the government, which leaves 44 million to do the work. Hey, just a thought. It's just a thought. 14 million are in the armed forces, which leaves 30 million to do the work. Deduct 20 million, that's the number in state and city offices, and that leaves 10 million to do the work. Now there are 6 million in hospitals, mental institutions, and various asylums, so that leaves 4 million to do the work. Now it may interest you that there are 3,999,998 people in jails and prisons. So that leaves just two people to carry the load. That's you and me, and I'm tired of doing everything myself. <laughs> Haven't we all been there? Haven't we sometimes felt like, is there anybody else working beside me? You know what I mean? We get this martyr complex, this pity poor me party. I'm the only one that's pursuing my dream. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. Well, what happens is we just get tired. And the moment we get exhausted, we set ourselves up for a discouragement. That's exactly what happened to Elijah. He put in his best day's effort. In fact, in fact you know what? I, I, because this happened, his greatest day happened on Mount Carmel. And then he had his worst moment afterwards. I always call it the Mount Carmel meltdown. <laughs> Do you relate to that? Sometimes after our highest days, come on now. Yep. 
boy, we, 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 just, we just go down. It, it, it's, it's just a natural sequence. Okay, the second um, thing that causes people to get discouraged is, is what I call naiveness. And, and I want to explain this because I think this is so key. So let me talk about it. Simplistically, Elijah felt that when he was on Mount Carmel and he had this great victory over King Ahab and the false prophets, you know what he thought? He thought after he had this great victory, everything was going to be fine. Oh, this is so key. Now what happens is, even after a great victory, there's a naiveness in the business or it's a naive in my own life. You know, when I was a pastor, if I had a great Sunday, you know what that meant? I had a great Sunday, but that didn't mean I was going to have a great month. That didn't mean I was going to have a great year. There had to be things built on top of it. And I think that Elijah literally became discouraged because he thought, after this great moment, my problems will be solved. Somebody came to Norm Vince Peel one time and he said, I'd just like to live where there are no problems. <laughs> Norm Vince Peel said, no problem. Took him right down to Woodlawn Cemetery. <laughs> no problems here. You know, life is this way, isn't it? Huh? And I think sometimes there is a naiveness. It, it's amazing how we somehow think that there's a place where we can go. Do you remember that? Did you ever do the song when you were a kid, Oh, Give Me a Home, Where the Buffalo Roam, Where the Nano, Where there Never is Heard? You've been there, haven't you? Huh? <laughs> you know what? I, I've never found that place yet. Uh, and I've been to Texas many times, and it's not there, I can guarantee you. It's not in Texas. But, but, but this, whole, th this whole thing, well, if I, there's a naiveness that sometimes we think, if I, just, if I get my business up to this level, I'll never get discouraged. That's not true. There, the third thing that happens when, we, when we're discouraged is we avoid responsibility. Now, one of the, one of the bad things about discouragement is what it causes us to do. And it's interesting because Elijah, when he had this discouraging moment, when he heard Queen Jezebel was really after his head, the whole bottom line is he got discouraged because the queen, after what he did on Mount Carmel, Queen Jezebel, Ahab's wife, said, I'm going to take your head, big boy. And he took off and he started running and said he was afraid and he ran for his life. Now, all of a sudden, I mean, I don't mean this wrong, but he was a leader of Israel. He wasn't meant to run. He was meant to lead armies and, and, and build dreams. Now all of a sudden he's right. What happens is, you know what, when we get discouraged, one of the first tendencies for us to do is to run from responsibility. To, 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 to do what number four is here, withdrawal. He not only ran for, and avoided his responsibility, but he, get, he went into withdrawal. It says he went a day's journey into the wilderness and sat down under the juniper tree. Now the withdrawal may be physical, it may be uh, geographical, it may be emotional, but what happens is when we're discouraged, there's a tendency for us to withdraw. And number five, here's another thing that is a result of discouragement. Faulty thinking. Wow. He didn't, he, you know what? He failed to think right when he got discouraged. In fact, you know what he did? He requested for himself that he might die, it says. Now here he is. Here's a guy that's got a great future, has had one of the greatest victories just in the last couple of days of his entire life. Israel is turning around the way that they're supposed to turn around, and now he wants to die. Now I can tell you what happens. This goes back to discouragement again. Discouragement causes us, it causes our thinking to become faulty, and we become discouraged, and what happens is we quit too soon. You know, again, my world, you know what my world, it says, my, my, my Bible world says, don't be weary in well-doing. For in due season, you will reap if you don't quit. If you don't quit. I mean, how much can we have if we just have tenacity and persistence and don't allow discouragement to begin to control the day? That's exactly what happened with, here's Elijah, faulty thinking, says, I'm going to quit. Might as well die. Nothing good's going to happen. Number six, oh, this is awesome. This is a great lesson. You can, you can really take this one and, and get a lot of stuff out of it on your own. Number six is, Faulty comparisons. Oh, man. This thing lives. I got so excited just developing this the other day when I was getting ready for you. I mean, it's so much fun to prepare. I have as much fun preparing the lessons as I do teaching the lessons. Because I'm learning like crazy. And, and I, sometimes I just get surprised. I, I was reading this passage and I looked at this. It said, because you know what he said? He said, I'm not any better than my father's. He said, let me die. I've looked around me. He started comparing himself with others. And I thought to myself, as I, I mean, it was like a light coming on. I thought, this is exactly what happens when we're discouraged. You know what we do? We look around. We'll look at somebody that's maybe doing a little bit better than we are, and we'll say, well, I'm just never going to get there. I mean, good night. I mean, they get all the breaks. Huh? 
and we begin to compare ourselves with other people. And what happens is sometimes the old self-image begins to lower, and all of a sudden we kind of get down in the dumps emotionally. Isn't this true? Yes. And I put a, oh, I put a great quote in it. This is, I, I am so glad I'm hearing this lesson. I tell you, I am so glad I'm hearing this lesson. We cannot consistently live in a manner that is inconsistent with the way that we see ourselves. That is so true. Discouragement causes us to begin to make faulty comparisons. Number seven, loss of creativity. The moment we become discouraged, one of the first things that goes is our creative spirit. And I love that it's in verse nine. Listen to this. I'll just read it to you. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. That's Elijah. And behold, God came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, Elijah, you're a leader. What are you doing sulking, having a pity, poor me party in a cave? Elijah, you weren't made for caves. You were made to, to take my nation and make it a great nation and lead people and build people and, and grow leaders and fulfill dreams and, and fulfill my calling on you. You were made for all this stuff. Here you are. You're, you're in a dark, dungy cave, isolated. What, Elijah, what are you doing there? I'll tell you what he's doing there. He lost his creativity. You see, you and I will crawl in the cave of life when we're discouraged. And all of a sudden, instead of being creative and being entrepreneurial and things that really make the business and make us a success, we begin to go inside and lose that creative edge off of ourselves. Number eight, watch this one. When we're discouraged, we blame other people. <laughs> I love it. I heard somebody over here say, never. <laughs> yeah. Well, never in the last moment. We blame other people. Look what he said. What did Elijah say? When he said, okay, Elijah, what are you doing in the cave? He said, well, I'm going to say, God, I've been zealous for you. I've been doing my very best. But these other sons of Israel, <laughs> George over there, huh? And he began, he, Elijah begins pointing out all these other people. He said, they've forsaken you, and they're not doing this right, and they're not doing that. Now, what's he doing? He's beginning now. He's in a cave, and he's saying, it's other people's fault that I'm here. Isn't it, isn't it a characteristic of discouragement that we begin to point at others? And blame them. And then watch this. Whoa, oh, oh, this is good. <laughs> Number nine, negative exaggeration. When we're discouraged, we blow this thing negative so far out. You know what? You know what? You know what Elijah said? When, when, you know, God's just talking to Elijah, trying to get him to get out of this discouragement punk. And you know what he said to God? He said, God, I'm the only one left. That's what he said. <sighs> Just me. <laughs> now, now, you see, what did he do? He began to negatively exact. You know what? He thought it was worse than it was. Which brings me to number 10. The tenth characteristic of discouragement. This is just a case. This is, this is just Elijah. You just go read this in the Old Testament yourself. Number 10, self-pity. The end result of discouragement, if handled wrongly, is self-pity. Now he's sucking his thumb, having a pity for me party. Eugene Peterson is one of my favorite writers. Everything he writes, I read. What he said here concerning the wrong kind of pity, I put in your notes because it is absolutely awesome. This is one of those things you just meditate on. Pity is one of the noblest emotions available to human beings. Self-pity is possibly the most ignoble. P pity is the capacity to enter into the pain of another in order to do something about it. Self-pity is an incapacity, a crippling emotional disease that severely distorts our perception of reality. Pity discovers the needs of others for love and healing and then fashions speech and action that brings strength. Self-pity reduces the universe to a personal wound that is displayed as proof of significance. Pity is the adrenaline for acts of mercy. Self-pity is a narcotic that leaves its addicts wasted and derelict. That's why I like Eugene Peterson. When you read Peterson, you think. He's one of the finest writers, thinkers in the country today. Now, what, what, you know what always Peterson's saying? He's just saying it very simple. If you have the right kind of pity, it will give you compassion for others. 
But the wrong kind of self-pity will destroy you because it'll go, it'll cause it to go inward. And that is the result of discouragement. In fact, one more thought, thought on Elijah. It's not in your notes, but it's just good. I couldn't help. Now, by this time, I'm working on this Elijah thing, and I'm going nuts because I'm saying, this is a marvelous case study. I'm, whoa, I like this better than life. And then all of a sudden, I saw what, it, what there were, there were, that God encouraged Elijah to do three things. He's dis- encouraged, he encouraged Elijah to get up, look up, and link up. He said, get up and get physical refreshment. In other words, come on, get up, refresh yourself physically so that you're okay. You've been tired. You've been, you, 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 the journey's been tough on you. Then he said, look up for the vision I have for you. In other words, you've lost the vision. You're under the juniper tree. All you can see are branches. Get out there, look up, look at this vision, and then link up with others for emotional refreshment. You know what he did? He, he got Elijah out of the cave. He got him back down the valley, and he had him meet a guy by the name of Elisha. And Elisha was to be a greater leader than Elijah. He was to do a mentoring project. He said, come on, link up. And, and you know what? When he went down and met Elisha, it says Elisha followed him, and it said that Elisha ministered to Elijah. Link up with relationships. Now, you know, isn't that good? Get up. In other words, if, if you're discouraged, you've got to get up. There's, a, there's an act that you and I do to get physical refreshment. We need to look up and get our vision. And then we need to link up with other people that will relationally give us emotional strength to help us to carry on. Good stuff. That's, that's all right there. Okay, now, that's the introduction of this lesson. How do you deal effectively with discouragement? Here we go. I'm going to give you several things here, but I'm going to give you the first one, which is the most important of all. Get the right perspective. If you and I are going to effectively deal with discouragement, we have to understand that it is a perspective issue. Now, I've read this to you before, but I want it on tape. I want everybody to have this because it's worth its weight in gold. This is a great letter on perspective. It's from a college girl to her mother. Here it is. Dear Mom, since I've been away at college one full semester, I think it's time to bring you up to date as to what is going on in my life. Shortly after I arrived at college, I got bored with dormitory life. I stole $10 out of my roommate's purse, and with that money, I rented a Honda bike, crashed it into a telephone pole a few blocks from college. I broke my leg, but was rescued by a young doctor who lives upstairs from the apartment house at the corner. He took me in, nursed me back to good health, set my leg, and thanks to him, I'm up and around again. We wanted to let you know that we're going to be married as soon as possible since we're having some trouble on the blood test because there's a disease that keeps showing up. We do hope, however, that we will be married before the baby arrives. (laughs) We will be home shortly thereafter to live with you and dad. (laughs) I know that you will love the baby as much as you have me, even though it will be of a different religion. But please try to understand the reason that we are having to come home and stay with you and dad is because my doctor friend wants out of medical school because of all the attention that he's had to give my physical condition. Really, Mom, I didn't steal $10 from my roommate's purse or rent a Honda bike or hit a telephone pole or break a leg. I did not meet a young doctor of a different religion, nor are we going to be married. There is no disease or test or baby to worry about. I won't be home to live with you and dad, and he won't be either. However... I am getting a D in geometry and an F in geology, and I wanted you to accept these grades in their proper perspective. (laughs) Says it all, doesn't it? Classic letter. Now, what I'm saying is when you're discouraged, I can almost guarantee you that one of the reasons we're discouraged is we have a perspective problem, and so I'm going to help you get your perspective back when you're discouraged. Letter A, see the whole picture. I can promise you discouraged people do not see the whole picture. They only see the negative part of it. Great quote, one discouraged person to another, what I need is a blessing that is not in disguise. (laughs) Huh? <laughs> you know, we all hear that. Oh, it's just a blessing in disguise. Doesn't that make you sick? Well, I, I like to have one that's not in disguise for one. You know, I like to know when that sucker's coming. You know what I mean? I like to feel it and enjoy it and have it for a while. I heard a cute story the other day about a man who was watching a Little League baseball game, and the score was very lopsided. In fact, it was after the first half of the in, first inning, it was 18 to nothing. 
And the guy sees this little right fielder coming in after they finally got three out, scores 18 and other. And he looked at him and said, I, uh, you don't look too discouraged. And the little kid looked at him and says, of course not. He said, we haven't batted yet. Wow. I want to tell you something. A lot of people, after the first half of the first inning, they lose perspective. They don't see the whole picture. They don't realize they've got nine innings to play. And it ain't over yet. So get the whole picture. Now, let her be. Take a short look at the problem. Very key. In getting the right perspective, in seeing the whole picture, I want you to take a short look at the problem. In other words, I want you to see it. I don't want you to live there, but I want you to see it. Norman Cousins. I don't know if you ever read his book. He wrote a tremendous book. But anyway, here's what, this is a quote out of his book. The main trouble with despair is that it is self-fulfilling. People who fear the worst tend to invite it. Heads that are down can't scan the horizon for new openings. Bursts of energy do not spring from a spirit of defeat. Ultimately, helplessness leads to hopelessness. Wow, that is so true. I had a friend of mine who went into one time a, a meeting of sales guys, and he held up a card just like that and said, what do you see? Well, obviously, the first thing they said they saw was the red dot. He said, that's like problems with most people. They don't see the clean sheet of paper. They don't see all the potential, the, all the opportunities. They just see the red dot. Well, what happens is I want you to take a short look at the problem, but I don't want you to live there. I have a quote in there that's very important. Many people, when suffering setbacks, ask the question, why? They never make real progress in their life until they move beyond that question. I'm a uh, Civil War buff. Margaret and I have marched all over battlefields. We've had our kids marching all over battlefields back east. We, for many, many years, took our kids back east every year just uh, for history because we both love history so much. In Kentucky, after the Civil War, Robert E. Lee was visiting a, a, a very wealthy southern Kentucky lady who they had a dinner together and they were out on the porch and she was grieving over the loss of the Civil War. And she pointed to a beautiful, what was one time, a beautiful magnolia tree. And she just pointed to him and said, uh, uh, General Lee, look at that tree. It's burned. It's scarred now. He said, she said, for generations that tree has shaded our family. And she was, of course, referring to the damages of the Civil War. And, and, and the historian, as he was telling the story, said the way that she said it to General Lee, she, she was hoping for some kind of an emotional kind of it's okay or, or sympathy. And General Lee, after hearing her, watching her point to that magnolia tree and hearing her talk about it and could tell that she was feeling sorry for herself, after pausing for several seconds, he looked, out at, it looked at her and said, Madam, cut it down and forget it. We have magnolia trees in our life that are scarred, and instead of cutting it down and forgetting it, we erect altars around it. We make shrines of them. And they become stumbling blocks. Every time we get out to the front yard of our life, we can't get to the drive because of things that we should have should have a long time ago put behind us. So what I'm saying is, to get the right perspective, take a short look at the problem. Now watch this, letter C. Take an inward look at yourself. Go inside yourself. This, is, this will help you in the area of discouragement. In other words, I'm going to talk to you about changing yourself for a moment. Sometimes you can't change your situation, but you change yourself. One of the uh, announcers for the Philadelphia Phillies one day, I was hearing him on the radio. I was listening to the game. And he was talking about a baseball player. And listen to this. He said, he's talking about a guy named it was Gary Maddox. And here's what he said. Gary has turned his life around. He used to be depressed and miserable. Now he's miserable and depressed. <laughs> now, that isn't where you want to be. Colonel Sanders. What, what's Colonel Sanders doing? He's on the porch in Kentucky, and he's 65, and a guy comes up and gives him a Social Security check. And on the inside, when he got that Social Security check, he asked himself, is this, is this what life's going to be from now on? Sitting on a check, or sitting on a check, <laughs> sitting, <laughs> sitting on a porch waiting for a Social Security check. Is this what it's going to be? You know what he did? He said, I don't want this to be my life. I, this, if, if this is retirement, I don't want it. 
sat down and made a list of everything that he could do well. I mean, he literally made a list. Took him a few days. In that list that he made, after he kept making his list and checking it twice, he came to the conclusion the thing that he could do that no one else could do is he was the only one that had his mother's recipe for chicken. And so he decided that he was going to be a cook and went down to a local restaurant and said, could I be a cook? I can make chicken like nobody else can make chicken. And he made chicken and everybody came to that restaurant pretty soon. That was the most popular thing on the menu. You know the story. So he started a restaurant and another restaurant and a chain of restaurants, Kentucky Fried Chicken. What he did is one day he looked at himself sitting on a porch and said, is this the way you want your life to be? I can tell you, if you're discouraged, one of the things we need to do is take an inward look at ourselves and say, is this, is this, is this what I want my life to be? Now, letter D, take a long look at leaders who have lasted. Take a short look at your problems. Take an inward look at yourself. Take a long look at leaders who last. We all know Napoleon Hill and Think and Go Rich, and he studied the lives of over 500 successful people. We know that the common element, we all know this, was what? Persistence. They kept on keeping on. One of my favorite people to read after. You can tell I like to read biographies. I'm reading Brinkley's right now. But, but one of my favorite people to read after is Winston Churchill. He, he probably better than anybody else really displays persistence during tough times. And sometimes I, I, I will read some of his speeches. Man, I, I put a couple paragraphs in it. It's not in your notes. I mean, when he, told, when he told England, we shall not flag or fail. We shall fight in France. We shall fight in the seas, on the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence, growing strength in the air. He was the guy, remember, they went to the school one time and said, never, 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 never give up. And he sat down. In fact, that's the speech he's known for the very most. He had a persistence. And I would just say, if you're discouraged, look around those that are lasting. Look at the ones who are hanging on there. That's their, and and get, draw strength and encouragement from them. Great poem on perseverance. I've had it for several years. I haven't used it for several years. Thought I'd throw it out at you today. Two frogs fell into a can of cream, or so I've heard it told. The sides of the can were shiny and steep, and the cream was deep and cold. Oh, what's the use, said number one. Tis fate. No helps around. Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye, sad world. And weeping still, he drowned. But number two of sterner stuff. Dog paddled in surprise, and while he wiped his creamy face and dried his creamy eyes, said, I'll swim a while at least. Or so it has been said, it wouldn't really help the world if one more frog was dead. An hour or two he kicked and swam, not once he stopped to mutter, but kicked and swam and swam and kicked, then hopped out via butter. <laughs> one more thing that will help you get perspective here. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Don't you love the Shakespeare stuff I throw at you? Huh? Uh, can, you can you handle me intellectually, huh? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I said, take, you know, take a short look at your problems. Take, a, take an inward look at yourself. Take a long look at leaders at last. I'm helping you get perspective. Take a wide look at the possibilities. Take a wide look at the possibilities that are before you. Wow, 52% of the CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies are from lower, middle class, or poor families. 80% of the millionaires in America are first-generation millionaires. When I say see the possibilities, I'm talking about looking around during discouraging times when, when things are kind of down and getting the best out of it. There, there was a guy named Lewis Waterman who was a salesman. and Back in the 1800s, he sat down and he sold a $50,000 insurance policy. He was so excited. It was big, I mean, a huge policy back there. Biggest one he'd ever saw. He got his pen out. The guy had been thinking about it. He got his pen out, and the guy s tried to sign it, and the pen didn't work. And he worked on it a while, and the pen didn't work. And finally, he just had He said, you know what? I think I want to think about this a little longer. And literally backed out of the policy. And Lewis Waterman said, that'll never happen to me again. And you know what he did? He became the founder of the fountain pen. And out of his discouragement and disappointment and loss of a sale, it took him to a whole new level. Let me tell you another story. In St. Mary's Hospital in London, 
A doctor had some cultures that he was working on in his laboratory and his careless laboratory assistant left a window open and material blew in on the cultures and ruined them. The doctor was so discouraged. His, by the way, his name was Fleming. You know where I'm going, don't you? The doctor was so discouraged. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know whether to throw them away, what to do. And then what he happened, what he happened to realize is he noticed some mold was growing on those cultures because of that window incident. And of course, out of it came penicillin. All I'm saying is, sometimes at our very lowest discouraging moment, the Franciscans in Northern California were, were some of the first to, to, to grow grapes, to make wine. And one year they had a terrible harvest and the grapes were all shriveled up. And, and they said, oh my goodness, we've lost the harvest. But they took those shriveled up grapes and you know what happened. That's the, that was the beginning of Sun Made Raisin Company. Now, all I'm saying to you and all I'm saying to all of us today is, is that you take your greatest discouraging times, your biggest disappointments, and you turn around and you, you, you make your setbacks springboards. Does that make sense? Perspective. Okay. Get the right perspective. That's number one in dealing with discouragement. Number two, see the right people. Not, not, now, now you get, are you with me? Get the right perspective. See the right people. Mark Twain one time remarked that he could live for two months on one good compliment. When I was a college senior theologue, getting ready to graduate with a five-year degree in theology, those seniors, one of our jobs was, one of our responsibilities as a senior, whether we were graded on tests on, is we, we all had a day to speak in senior chapel, which was the most fearing thing that we did as college graduates. I mean, this was awful. We're getting ready to to speak to our peers and everybody's there and they're going to see, you know, they're going to listen to us and say, you know, is he or is she not going to make it, the whole process. So I remember my senior day in chapel, I spoke. I had a professor by the name of Don Brown who, when I finished speaking, handed me a note. And I, I knew the note would be something about what I said, I, or I figured it would be. So as quickly as I could, I got it alone so I could look at the note because I admired this professor. Open the note and it said, Dear John, as I listen to you today, I realize that you have a great future. I can hardly wait to see what the next 20 years will unfold in your life. I hope to be there when you're at the top of your profession. I have that note today. That's the power of words. When you're discouraged, see the right people. Solomon said, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Listen to this one. Here's a great story. Walt Whitman struggled for years to get anyone interested in poetry. He was discouraged. Then he received a note. Dear sir, it began, I am not blind to the worth of the wonderful gift of leaves of grass. I find it the most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom that America has yet contributed. I greet you at the beginning of a great career. It was signed Ralph Waldo Emerson. John Wooden was my favorite basketball coach. He was the greatest basketball coach. He had the greatest basketball team in the history of college athletes. There's no question about it. Seventy, what, six straight games they won at one time. Ten or eleven national championships. Here, anyway, here. John Wooden was the guy that started this thing in basketball. When a guy throws you a good pass that sets you up for a layup or for a shot, John Wooden said, as you're running back down the floor after you scored your basket, point to the guy, nod, give him a wink, signify to the whole crowd that he's the guy that made the basket possible. And one of the basketball players said, well, what if the person who set the play up doesn't look? And John Wooden said, don't worry, he'll be looking. <laughs> Now, all I'm saying is, see the right people. My dad is an awesome guy. In fact, Jim and I were with my dad in Dallas, Texas, and he's 73. And I've got, a, in fact, Jim, if you remind me sometime, I've got a great story about dad's health that we just got a wonderful, wonderful report on. He had a heart attack in May, a major heart attack. Bottom one third of his heart was dead. He had a heart catheterization and angioplasty, the whole works. They just took him in last Tuesday for another one. Opened up the whole process to do the, do, for the artery that had clogged again. And his, his surgeon, his heart surgeon out at Florida Hospital in Orlando, Florida, said for the, he said, I, you know, the guy, the heart surgeon, I, I met him when I was down there, Dr. Willis, he's probably 55. 
been a heart surgeon for many, many years. First time he said ever he's seen this happen, my father's bottom one third of the heart that was dead is resuscitating and coming back to life. He said, I've never seen it. In fact, he said, Dr. Maxwell, I'm going to tell you something. He said, in a few months on you now, and really get you stress on you now, and really get you straightened up. Isn't that wonderful news? I mean, I, now, 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 but my dad, here, here's the story. My dad's an awesome man. He just, uh, he was college president for 17 years. Just a great, great man. He's, he's, he's my hero. He's, he taught me almost everything I know about leadership. He's a great leader himself. I remember when I was still in college, I came home for a weekend, and Dad said, I'm going to go down to uh, Laurelville, Ohio, to see an old pastor. The guy was about 80. His name was Mr. Turner. He said, do you want to go with me? I said, well, sure, Dad. I hadn't been with him, of course, been in college. So we jumped in the car, went down there. And uh, I said on the way, and I said, Dad, what you doing? He said, I'm going down to encourage Mr. Turner. He said, all of his life, he's, he's worked hard, and he's now on the shelf, and nobody calls on him. And, and he said, I, I'll, I'll never forget, he looked at me as we're, he's driving that car, and he said, John, I've decided all of my life to once a week find somebody who needs encouragement and encourage them. And I went down, I watched him literally make that man's month. As he encouraged him and he believed in him. Now, all I'm saying is when you're discouraged, find somebody that can pick you up. That's just, it's just get, get around somebody that will encourage you. See the right people. Now, isn't it true you wake up in the morning, you got et cetera and headache? Aren't there some people that are the right people? You say, oh, God, help me to see them today. Isn't that right? You know, they'll cheer you up. They'll make your life better. Aren't there other people who say, dear God, in your sovereignty. <laughs> hmm? If there's a God... Don't allow me to see that person today. Huh? Isn't that right, huh? Because aren't there some people that just pull you down? Now, just like I say, you can see the wrong, right people, you can see the wrong people. Now, let me give you just a little advice. It's just a little homemade advice about negative people. Once in a while when I do an attitude seminar, and I'll have a few hundred leaders in there, I'll say, now, let me tell you what to do when you run into negative people. I mean, people that just tear you down, discourage, just, 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 they just are an anchor to life. Okay? I said, what you do when they start discouraging, they just keep talking. I said, here's what you do. You take this left finger right here on this left hand and you put it in this left ear. <laughs> you take this right hand and this right finger here and you put it in this right ear. Now, let me tell you something. You watch how I'm doing this. If you're listening to this tape, <laughs> I have my left finger in my left ear and my right finger in my right ear. Do not confuse them and try to get the right finger in the left ear and the, the left. It just gets too cumbersome. You put the left finger in the left ear and the right finger in the right ear. You close your eyes when you hear these negative people and you go, ah! <laughs> You only have to do it once. <laughs> I promise you. Yeah, just one time. Now, fo folks, I've done this. This works. This really works. All you got to do is do it one time. You set them back so bad because they're not used to people doing that to them. Now, now, here's what's wonderful. If they forget and come around and start to slip and be negative again on you, all you have to do is go for the ear. And, and you get about right here. You get about right here, and they shut up immediately. Huh? That's all you got to do. That's good. Now, what I'm saying is when you're discouraged, see the right people, you'll get encouraged. See the wrong people, you'll jump off a bridge. Look at my desire. I want not only to see the right person when I'm discouraged, but I want to be the right person when someone else is discouraged. My dad told me one time, he said, remember, John, everyone that you come into contact with is fighting a battle in their life. I believe that with all my heart. Okay, so what do you do? You get the right perspective. You see the right people. Number three, Say the right words. Oh, this is so good. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was at one time the great, greatest heart surgeon in England, this is in your notes, says in his excellent work, Spiritual Depression, It's Cause and Cure. Now, this, this is an incredible quote, folks. Most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself rather than talking to yourself. That's worth the whole tape right there. Remarkable? Most of your unhappiness in life comes from listening to yourself. Think about it. You wake up in the morning 
And right away, there are streams of thoughts coming into your mind. You haven't invited them. You didn't ask for them. You're not consciously doing anything to produce them. They just come and they start talking to you. You see, you know what? Listening is passive and talking is active. And what happens when we're discouraged is there's a tendency for us to become great listeners of our feelings and our emotions instead of talking to them. And so let me, let me just let's make this as practical as I can because I really believe this. I really believe that what happens when we become discouraged is we become very passive in our personality and we become a listener and we do not take command of our emotions by talking to them. So, so let, me, let me illustrate this. Let me ask you a question. This is a little discussion. I'm going to let you enter in here. So get sharp here, all right? This is your chance, the only chance in this tape. So let's get with it. <laughs> what words do you say to overcome discouragement? Now, I've got a whole vocabulary because I've done this all my life. I understand that you talk, you talk to your emotions when they become negative. I understand this process. You don't listen to them and just let the, don't let these emotions and feelings and thoughts lay on you but what you do is you start talking back to them and confronting them. For example, I'm going to give you an example. Then, then you throw maybe one at that you've used. One, one of the words that I, or phrases that I use when I'm discouraged is I have a phrase that I, I, when I'm really feeling down, I'll say to myself, this too shall pass. All it does is give me perspective. I just talk and I say, talk on, I'm feeling low. I'm not, I don't feel good. I don't feel good about what happened. I feel kind of bad. Hey, this too shall pass. Huh? Is this just for the moment? It's going to pass. It's, it's, it's here today, but it's going, baby. In fact, I can see it going. See, you start talking to yourself. Now, what phrases do you use to talk to yourself, to lift yourself out of discouragement? Have you ever thought about this? Jump one on me. Give me one. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's all right. You can say it. Okay, absolutely. Last year, this day, I in other words, what you're saying to yourself, that's a good one. What you're saying to yourself is whatever was bugging, I don't... It's going to pass. I won't remember next week what I'm going through right now. Okay, good one. Yes? We can do anything temporarily. That's right. We can do anything temporarily. You better believe. So I've got a, I've got a bad situation. I'm good for a couple of days. I, can, I can't do it all for life, but for a little bit I can do it. Yes, ma'am? God's in control. God's in control. Great one for sovereignty. Okay, yes? Problems come to pass, not to stay. Yeah, problems come to pass, not to stay. Isn't that a good one? Yeah, these are good. Yes? Look how far I've come. You may, hey, you think it's bad today? You ought to have seen me yesterday, huh? Uh, yes? Fast forward the tape. Oh, fast forward the tape. That's good. Not this tape. Oh, excuse me. Excuse, excuse, excuse me. Just a second. You that are listening to this awesome tape on discouragement, we don't mean this tape, you fast forward. We mean the tape of life. I almost lost thousands of people right there. Just, just, just hundreds were getting ready to toss me out the window of their car. They thought we meant this tape. Okay, good. These are good. Any others? Yes? With God, all things are possible. Sure, with God, all things are possible. Hey, I can hang in here for a while. I, 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 you know, keep your chin up. Another one I love is do it anyway. Yeah, do it anyway. Okay, so it's a bad day. Go ahead and do what you're supposed to do, and it could be worse. Huh? This, this how, in other words, what you've got to do is you've got to start talking back to your emotions, because I can tell you, discouraged, depressed people become passive, get in a corner, get in the cave, and they allow life to talk to them, and they become flooded with the negative emotion of life, and then they become overcome. Here's one of my favorite ones I use all the time. It's not what happens to me, it's what happens in me. It's not the discouraging moment that's going to knock me down unless I allow it on the inside to knock me down. And I have a couple wonderful quotes in here. Uh, for you from, by Ralph Waldo Emerson and Tyrone Edwards. You can read those on your own. All, all I'm saying is say the right words. Now, now let's review this. Get the right perspective. See the right people. Say the right words. Are you ready for number four? Here we go. This is the most important part of the lesson I'm taking you to right now. Make the right decisions. Now this will be a little fun just for a moment. Uh, th th these are just some in fact, let's take a moment. Let me read it to you. Do you sometimes feel dog tired at the end of your work day? Maybe you're burning up more calories than you think you are. There are, some, there are the ways, these are the ways that you exercise in the number of calories per hour consumed. When you beat around the bush, it's worth 75 calories. <laughs> Jogging the memory is worth 125. Jumping to conclusions, 100. Climbing the walls, 150. <laughs> Swallowing pride, that's a big one, 150. Huh? <laughs> Uh, passing the bucks, only 25. There's not much in there, so you don't want to do that to it. Beating your own drums, 100. Hey, throwing your weight around is 300. <laughs> and for some of us, more than that. Okay. Turning the other cheek is 75. Dragging your heels, 100. Pushing your lucks, 250. Oh, isn't that fun? Okay, let's go on. Here we go. Here we go. Courage. 
Now I'm, talk, I'm, I'm talking now about really getting yourself put together, not only saying the right words, but I'm talking now about really dealing with discouragement. Here's courage, the willingness to look at life as it is and to look at yourself as you are and to come to terms. There's a whole lesson right there. And I wrote in here just for you, it's not easy to apologize, to begin over, to, become a, to be unselfish, to take advice, to admit error, to face sneers, to be charitable to avoid mistakes, to keep on trying, to be considerate, to endure success, to profit by mistakes, to forgive and forget. In other words, cut the magnolia tree down. To think and then act, to keep out of a rut, to make the best of a little, to subdue an unruly temper, to maintain a high standard, to shoulder a deserved blame, to recognize a silver lining. It's not easy to do any of those things. It always pays. Now I'm going to take you into the peak to peak principle. And in your notes, I want you to look at this very carefully. This is a wonderful visual to talk to you about making the right decisions. Here's what I find. Discouraged people are prone often to make poor decisions. Now, what you've got there are, are some valleys and some mountaintops, okay? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to, on the top of those mountain peaks, on that flat area, I want you to put the letter D on those three mountaintops. And what this visual illustration is, is to help you understand that you and I ought to only make decisions when we're at the top of our life, not in the valley of our life. The reason it's called the peak to peak principle is, it's a very simple principle. Robert Schuller taught this to me 10 years ago, but it's a great principle. The principle is very simple. If you make your decisions on top of the mountain, are you ready? Watch this one. Why should we make major decisions on the mountain top? Five reasons. Letter A, you see more clearly. You get the whole perspective. When you're in the valley, you don't see clearly. You can't even see far. Letter B, you are running to something, not from something. Very key. When discouraged and we make decisions, most of the time, we're not running to something, we're running from something. And whenever you and I decide anything that causes us to run from something, it'll have a negative impact on our life. Letter C. I love this one. You leave others in a better position. If you make your major decisions on top of the mountain, if you're a leader and you're influencing people, where are they? On top of the mountain. You have given them an opportunity for advancement. Letter D, you decide on positive data rather than negative. That's very important. When you're on top of the mountain and you make those peak-to-peak -peak decisions, you decide on positive data, not on, not on negative. And letter E, you get to stay on top. And the reason is you get a, you get a jump from peak to peak to peak instead of from valley to valley to valley. E. Stanley Jones that I met as a freshman, my dad took me to meet him as a freshman, said, when life kicks you, let it kick you forward. <laughs> now, gang... This is a key on discouragement. Listen carefully. Every major decision you make in your life, you should only make when you're on top, not on bottom. You see, if you make a major decision when you're at the bottom, emotionally discouraged part of your life, you'll literally jump out of the frying pan, usually right into the fire. If you're going to quit, quit on top, not on bottom. If you're going to leave something, leave when it's at the best, not at the worst. I've only made in my life four major moves. And all four times I made those moves when I was completely on top. My last move that I just made from Skyline, I can tell you, I waited until it was up there as high as it had ever been so that I could leave with the best days and the best years and the best moments and the, and the finances were at the best and the, the team, the, the, the staff was at the best. I wanted to leave it out on top. Now, here's what I'm saying to you. When we're discouraged, the tendency is that we'll do anything to get away from the heat. 
And so we have a tendency to want to make major decisions at the bottom. My daughter, my daughter Elizabeth, perfect example. She's in college. She's a beautiful freshman girl at college. She came home the other day and we were talking. She said, Daddy, she said, I'm, I want to change my roommate at school. I said, Sissy, did you have a blow up? Have an argument? Have a little tiff? Oh, a couple days ago, yeah. She's wearing my clothes, and, you know, here we go, here we go. Major stuff for college kids. And, you know, I said, well, I said, Sissy, let me tell you something. It may be a right decision for you to change roommates, but you can't make the decision now. Why, Daddy? Because you're emotionally down. Now, I'm going to give you some tickets to the Chargers game. You take your roommate. Go have some fun. Sunday evening, if you want to change roommates, we'll make the decision. How many times have you and I make the decision when we're down instead of up? It'll always cost us. Number five, number five, do the right things. Do the right things. The best quote in the entire lesson is here. So if you'll allow me, it's a little long, but if you'll allow me, let me walk you through it. Despair is part of our living. We despair when our hopes are dashed. We despair when wars persist. We despair when Ill, uh, illness lingers. Despair seems like a dead-end street where everything ends. But not a few things, not a few times, answers have been found in moments of despair. Ideas have sparked. Hope has been etched anew. Many such occasions are telling us that we can use our despair creatively. The despair that besets us when frustrations come can be of two kinds, a despair that causes us to give up or a despair that makes us go to the depths and draw from our best resources. One kind is futile, the other is fruitful. Despair, is com despair comes uninvited, but only remains where it is entertained. Ooh. If it is nurtured, through depressive thoughts and fed with pessimistic attitudes, it remains. But when the soul takes flight to greater thoughts, despair flees. Hope, faith, and a positive will starve despair. Despair is not handled by giving in. It is handled best by giving out. Giving out something of ourselves to others by giving out a person has no time for despair, so it departs. Isn't that a great statement? You know what it's like? It's like the uh, distance runner. Now, I'm not a runner. You can look at me and see the only place I run to is the donut shop. <laughs> hey, man, I run to them cream puffs, baby. Yes, I do. Huh? Now, I, I'm not a runner, but let me tell you what runners tell me. Let me tell you what the, the good, healthy people that are going to live a long time tell me. They tell me that when you're running, you, you, know, you're, you, get, you get weary, you get tired, and you start looking for second wind. And if you can get through all the pain to the second wind, it gets easier, huh? That's what I did now. I've never been there, so I, I'm only telling you what I've heard. But what you've got to do is you've got to get to that second wind. How many times, I wonder, have we stopped short of our second wind? Huh? Helen uh, Steiner, perhaps you've read some of her tremendous poems, tremendous lady, um, had a tragic life. She wanted to go to college. Uh, her dad died of the flu, was unable to go to college. She married a guy, uh, had one year of wonderful marriage, stock market uh, crashed in New York back in the times when it went down, and her husband committed suicide, and she had setback after setback after setback. And, and she wrote for many years, and her poetry didn't go anywhere until one year, one time, they, they read one of her poems on the Lawrence Welk show. And here's the poem that they read, and it just really helps us with discouragement. It's in your notes. So together we stand at life's crossroads and view what we think is the end. But God has a much bigger vision. He tells us it's only a bend. For the road goes on and is smoother, and the pause in the song is a rest, and the part that's unsung and unfinished is the sweetest and richest and best. So rest and relax and grow stronger. Let go and let God share your load. Your hope is not finished or ended. You've just come to a bend in the road. Wow. My dad was at Promise Keepers with Jim and me, and I was telling you a little bit earlier about his heart issue. 
He's had to slow down since he's had his heart attack. So we were going, I was getting ready to go down and speak to 62,000 men. Jim, you'll remember this. One of these great pastor friends had been talking to my dad. He didn't know who he was, but my dad was there encouraging him, you know, and, and pouring into his life. And so dad had told him about his heart attack. And he said, now, my son John's going to speak here a little bit. He said, now, John's on the front burner of what? Now, I've got this heart attack, so I can't do everything I used to be able to do, but I'm on the back burner. But he said, I want to tell you something. He said, there's a fire there. And I'm on the back burner but I'm still cooking. <laughs> when he was telling it, Jim, he was saying, he kept repeating my dad's word, I'm on the back burner, but I'm still cooking. I, I want to tell you something. You may be discouraged, you may be down, you may be depressed, you may be saying, I, I, this has been my worst day, but I want to tell you something. Keep the fire going. Be on the back burner maybe for a period of time. You, this too shall pass, remember. But while you're on that back burner, don't feel sorry for yourself. Just keep on still cooking and you'll make it through and come out better on the other side.